I'm talking about extreme events, extreme untoward incidents in organisations. I'm looking at the causes of those events and what organisations can do to mitigate them. I'm looking at impacts, uh, issues around um, blame, blame culture, um, and how we can create a just culture inside the organisation. Good morning. So, thank you, Owen. Um, I'm going to pick up on a lot of the points that have already been mentioned in, in that presentation, which I thought was fantastic. And I thought a lot of the, the lessons for leadership in that, um, you'll see that I'll pick up on and develop as we go through this presentation. I will be also doing the Black Hawk video today um, and building on that, um, but really focusing around issues of leadership in complex organisations. For me, leaders inside organisations, leadership's about doing leadership. It's the practice of leadership that I'm interested in. So what do leaders inside organisations do? I'm also quite interested in the absence of leadership. So sometimes we learn more about leadership when it's not there, and particularly around serious untoward incidents. So a lot of what I'll be talking about today is when things go wrong. And I'll be talking about organisational resilience. Um, and just to be clear at the start of this, that I'm talking about the organisational aspects of, of resilience. Uh, there's a lot of talk around individual resilience and mental toughness and all of that agenda. This is about sustaining organisations in the long term, the avoidance of serious untoward incidents. This is about delivering the mission of the organisation in the long term. So uh, one, of the, one of the little anecdotes that was dropped in earlier was Ratner's. You know, Ratner's would have been seen as a, a resilient organisation until Gerard Ratner stood up that day in front of the media and said, you know, something around, we, we sell rubbish or something. Um, and Immediately the next day, the organisation was ruined, brand reputational damage for that organisation. Um, and as leaders in the organisation, in your organisations, that could be you. Okay, so what I'm going to be presenting today, um, hopefully, is thought-provoking, is challenging, and it will make you think a little bit differently about your leadership and how you take up your leadership role within the organisations that you're in. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about how I got into this whole area. Um, I'm an academic, work at Cranfield, and um, prior to joining Cranfield, I actually worked for a professional services firm for a while. I kind of did my PhD, got a bit disillusioned with academia because people were telling me to write some papers for, that would go into journals that no one would ever read, and I actually really wanted to have an impact on practice. Um, so I joined a professional services firm, and I was part of the management consultancy division of that professional services firm. And uh, back in 2003, this event happened. Anyone remember? No, it snowed. Okay? <laughs> big deal, it snowed. Um, and it was quite a big deal. The cars were trapped on the M25 and on the M11 overnight. Um, no one died, no one was injured, but people were trapped in their cars. It was an inconvenience. The organisation that I worked for were responsible for not gritting the roads on the M11 and the M25. So they'd had the warning from the Met Office, they'd got the contractors sitting in the yard with the lorries ready to go, and they didn't initiate the gritting of the roads. Now, the next day, it was on the front page of every newspaper in the country. The organisation that I worked for had seemed to be a failed organisation. You know, doing something as simple as initiating the gritting when they'd had the warning sign. This is about informed judgement, the judgement of senior leaders in the organisation. And, you know, I, I tried to explore that, tried to work out what happened, and it was very difficult because there were so many management failings in the decision-making process. One of the outcomes of this event, apart from the trial by media for the following few weeks, in, it was loss of contracts for that organisation. This was an organisation that prided itself on 10, 15-year contracts with a small number of key clients. Its whole business was built about, around brand and reputation, which was damaged. 
we often think about safety, resilience, reliability is expensive to do. And so is having an accident. Ask BP. The cost of the Macondo well. And also, it, it affects the organisation, the morale, the motivation within the organisation. If you've ever been in an organisation that's had a serious untoward incident, it's not a nice place to be, and it wasn't in this organisation. And it also kind of affects what are we trying to do here? You know, we're espousing to be an ethical organisation, one that makes good decisions, one that delivers to our customers, yet we're not walking the talk because we failed in something so basic. So it was quite a difficult place to be. One of the outcomes of this was that I was actually sent to Cranfield to set up a research centre, to work on a research centre, which was basically given the question, how do we design an organisation not to fail? Which, um, as you can sort of probably understand, was quite a difficult question, and I've been kind of grappling with that ever since. Um, and I've been working across a range of different organisations addressing this issue. And what I see is that some organisations operate in environments where they really should fail every day. The complexity of the environment is so great, but they don't. So how do they do that? Yet other organisations have all the systems and processes in place to prevent failure, yet they fail all the time and often have recurrence of, of these incidents. And I've really sort of looked at the role of leadership in these organisations, and that's what I'm going to talk about as, as we go through this. Um, I want to talk first about a kind of familiar story. So I've worked in the nuclear industry, oil and gas. I've worked with six hospital trusts. I've worked with high security mental health. I've worked with fire and rescue crews, a range of different sectors. And what I find is I have the same conversation with people inside the organisation. Okay, it's pretty much the same story. The acronyms change, the actual details change, but the story remains pretty much the same. And I'll see if this sort of resonates with you. So I kind of go in and, and we have, get into a conversation about resilience and reliability, high reliability, and they say, actually, we've made so much progress. You know, we've done so much over the last few years. And they say, OK, safety is our number one priority. We've got risk management processes in place. We've all been on the courses. We've all done our risk registers. And... We're pretty good at measuring and reporting and monitoring. We're very good at the health and safety aspects. Everyone goes on their mandatory courses. We've got procedures. And in fact, if you come to this room, I can show you so many procedures. We're so proud of the 7,000 procedures that we've got in one hospital that I've been working with. Um, and we're pretty good at investigations and root cause analysis. You know, after every incident, we drill down, we identify those causes, we, those, those causes, we, ident we put them into an action plan. And my God, we're brilliant at emergency response. In fact, when there's a fire, we, we really get into gear and we're fantastic. Okay, so that's pretty much the, the story that I hear. And you think, well, that sounds wonderful. And then you get into sort of the next conversation, which is, yeah, and we still have surprising events. And it's pretty much the same story, as I said, across different organisations, whether it's in the nuclear industry or whether it's in oil and gas or whether it's in the health service or social services departments. And what is really remarkable, the more I've looked at this and I've done over the last decade, is that there is a recurring pattern. You can see the same reasons for these events occurring regardless of the, of the industry. And for me, that means that we can learn quite a bit from these events, because if we can understand the recurring pattern, then we can intervene to stop these things happening. But that isn't typically what happens, um, because when you look at the investigation reports of the incidents, these were taken from uh, one quite famous hospital trust that's um, got a very good reputation, in fact, which will remain nameless as will most of the organisations that, that I've discussed today. Um, but one hospital trust had, I looked at the in investigation reports that they produced over a two-year period. Okay, you go to the action plans in the back, and they're all the same. There were about 30 events that, they, that I looked at, um, and we got a sort of the usual suspects that came out of that. Okay, so it was a procedural error, so what's the app? action plan, that's updated, that's lengthened it, that's ensured compliance. It's a team working error. 
so we've got to provide some more training and so on. Now, it kind of, the question I asked, which was a challenging question, was if you actually get the same action plans after you've done every root cause analysis, why do you need to do the next one? You know, the focus all the time is on the action, on, on doing investigations in a kind of cycle, but before you can get to the action planning phase and implementation, you're on to the next event and go, going around in the cycle. And I think this is probably the most famous of those cycles, um, a seven-year cycle, in fact. So, um, as you all know, Victoria Columbia killed in London Borough of Haringey in 2000. Lord William Laming produces the report in 2003. Notice the timeline. The report comes out three years later. Um, Lord William Laming is then interviewed in 2007 and says on the BBC, I'm dismayed at the fact that organisations haven't implemented what I regard as basic good management practices. Later, six months later, we hear about the baby P, Peter Connolly incident, again in the same London borough of Haringey, and Sharon Shoesmith is kind of hounded out of her job by the the press. So recurring cycle, a lot of the, lot of the factors involved are very similar. You know, a child in care killed by guardians. Um, and we could look at Challenger and we could look at Columbia, we could look at Texas City and we could look at the Macondo. Well, actually there's a recurring pattern inside these organisations. Okay. So why... What, why do I think this is a leadership issue? Because I think this is about organisational culture. And I'll come to later on talking about a just culture. And we talk a lot about blame inside the organisation and trust, which is the theme of your week. So I'm going to come back to that theme. But for me, leaders create the culture inside organisations. So if you're the future leaders, you are creating the culture inside your organisations. And leaders do that not by the fancy mission statements and the vision and all of this. It's actually just what they notice, what they pay attention to. People watch leaders inside the organisation. And as Owen said, what a leader walks past in the organisation sets the standard for that organisation, sets the culture for the organisation, what they measure, control and reward. That sets the culture of your organisation. And what you see in organisations is sometimes leaders aren't conscious of the cultures that they're creating. Okay, so mid-staffs being a, a classic example of that. So what I'm going to try and get you to do is think about the, the culture inside your organisation, your role in shaping that, that culture through your leadership actions. Okay. What I see in organisations is, is a real split between two different perspectives around resilience, reliability, safety agenda. And I think this is underpinned by how leaders think about the agenda, the, the culture of the organisation, their own perspective. Okay, and, and again, see if this resonates and which side of this you sit on. Because this is really important in terms of blame cultures inside organisations, okay, which I'll come, come to later. So one way of thinking, which is you create resilience through containment and control. This is the typical perspective that we have. And I, ha I talk to leaders in organisations. This is usually the perspective, particularly if they come from a clinical or an engineering background. This is usually manifest. So... Containment and control. So the idea here, the perspective is that designers, you can create the organisation design and the system that are reliable and they are, can be controlled within a kind of acceptable range of variance. Okay? And therefore, accidents are caused by something failing because normally we're reliable and then something fails. And it's usually a person that screws up or a bit of kit that fails. Okay? So this is the perspective. The generally, from, particularly from the engineer, is that we can automate systems. Okay, you see this in your cars every day. We're now getting attenuators in cars and smart sensors and so on because we actually think that automation is the way to reduce human error. And what we can also do is build layers of protection, put the barriers in place 
and procedures being a key part of the barriers that we put in place inside organisations to stop things going wrong because we see it as a failure of an individual or a part of the system. Okay. There's a different view, which is the resilience view. And you see this much less, but a lot of the research evidence that's coming out is that resilient organisations, high reliability organisations, leaders, take more of this perspective, okay, which is different. So this perspective, every day, the people at the front line make up for the problems that designers put into the system. Okay, complete reframing of the problem here. Actually, 99% of the time, safety is achieved by people at the front line adapting to their context, adapting and intuitively making small adjustments to the system to keep things safe. Therefore, a failure is a temporary breakdown in that person's ability to make sense of their environment and to adapt. And if that's true, then we can help people deal with complexity and uncertainty and we can design organisations to anticipate and to adapt to problems. Now, that is a completely different mindset shift for leaders to take on inside the organisation. Okay? A lot of the organisations that I've seen have errors are firmly embedded on the left-hand side and the more resilient ones on the right-hand side. Okay. And so, for me, organisational resilience, this is organisational resilience, is the organisation's ability to adapt and absorb this variation in the complexity of the environment, particularly disturbances that the organisation's never seen before the surprising unexpected events. And that's the problem with the left-hand side mentality because you get locked in by the procedures and therefore you drive out the adaptive cap capacity. <coughs> okay, now I've talked quite a bit um, about this as an intro. Um, the best way to show you this and to give you sort of an experience of this is to, to show you a video which was mentioned before. Um, and the reason I show this video is one, it's completely different context to one that you are used to. So I'm going to show you a video, believe it or not, of a friendly fire incident involving two Black Hawk helicopters that were shot down by two F-15s, killing everyone on board, humanitarian aid workers in northern Iraq. There were no enemy aircraft in the no-fly zone for three years. It was broad daylight. They had the best technology and some of the best people in the world under radio contact and under one of these AWACS, the watch of the AWACS, which is one of these aircraft with a big mushroom on the top, okay? And you think, how can some of the best trained people in the world using some of the best technology screw up and kill all these people? Okay. So the question in your mind, as, we, as I play the video, is this a failure to control or is this this adaptive, failure of this adaptive capability? And the key question also, which I'll come back to afterwards, was who would you blame? Who would you court martial for it? Okay. I will say that this video, before I play it, I'm not Ridley Scott, I'm not Steven Spielberg. I produced this myself, okay? It's not 3D, it's not Jurassic Park. Um, but it, it's actually the true story, and I took all of the evidence from the investigation reports and various news, newsreel snippets that I could find and the testimonies of the individuals involved. So it's, it's the true story based on the evidence. A bit of a depressing tale, um, but I think a powerful one. And to be honest, I could have created the video from any number of events, that never events that I've worked in, in hospitals or in the nuclear industry or oil and gas. Similar pattern that goes on here. Lots of small things going wrong. Lots of people could have intervened but chose to walk past and people not understanding how all of those little things that each on their own would never have caused the problem and were probably occurring every day, just luck comes into this. The combination of those things on that day leads to a major incident. Okay. I put in the middle of that mindfulness and the importance of mindfulness um, for me, it's critical. Um, and mindlessness, if I give you sort of an example that you'll relate to, is when you drive to work one morning, you get to work, 
and you think, how the hell did I get here today? Okay, that's mindlessness. You're not paying attention to the environment, what's going on. The problem is some people continue like that till six o'clock in the evening. Um, and how do we actually keep ourselves safe? Is it on the left-hand side because we've got the highway code in the glove compartment of our, our cars? Or is it because we're actually paying attention to other road users, adapting to situations, noticing and making small adjustments? And for me, that's the key to, to resilience. Um, where I want to take this now is to talk about blame and the just culture idea. Um, I asked a question before this, which was, who would you court-martial? So maybe we'll do a show of hands. Um, who would court-martial Pilkington, the guy at the top? Any hands? One. Okay. Right. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, did no one see it then? Okay, that kind of... Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I wish you'd have said because we could have adjusted it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those who did see it, <laughs> this, is, this is adaptation in the moment. Um, those who, who did see, um, would anyone court-martial Pilkington? Yeah, some people at the back. Good, you could see it. Excellent. Um, the F-15 pilots, a bit gung-ho. Yeah, any hands for that? Yeah. Um, what about the guys, that were, the guys that were asleep on the AWACS? Okay, that's interesting. A lot more hands for that. that. Uh, what about the, the, the boss on the AWACS? Yeah, a few on, few on that one. What about the Black Hawk pilots? The dead ones. Yeah, they didn't follow procedure. Um, and what about the guy that was on his first day on the job? No? Interesting. Interesting, isn't it? How we sort of, th with an event like that, you could pick any number of those individuals. And to be honest, if you had a good lawyer, you could probably convict or... Um, they could, you could get them off the hook on, on either case because you could make a convincing argument either way. Yeah. Because it's a system failure. It's a system failure. Um, and what actually happened was they tried to court-martial the, the, um, one of the senior directors on the AWACS. The guy that showed... There was a picture, kind of Asian-looking chap that that his only role in this was he said affirmative when they said, sir, are you listening to this? Um, and he was controlling the en route controller in the no-fly zone, the world where the console broke and they now had their back to each other. So he was the one that was in charge of those two. So a team leader who said affirmative and they tried to court-martial him for that. And when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. You wouldn't court-martial the person at the bottom because, you know, First day on the job, who could blame them? Um, you're probably not going to go to the guy at the top because that's just a bit too high and leaders really never get court-martialed for this kind of thing, do they? Um, unless they make a major mistake in the media, um, like Sharon Shoesmith, who said it's not the fault of my, my staff, it's not my fault, and she was kind of hounded out of her job. And Tony Haywood at BP, where he said to the media, I want my life back. So as long as you kind of handle the media properly or reasonably well... Um, probably not going to get there. So sort of a middle manager level is probably going to be the scapegoat. Um, but it was, it was quashed. Um, it was thrown out. So no one was court-martialed, which again is fairly typical of this, that no one eventually gets blamed. Um, going back to the point around, was this about a control or a containment issue? Was it adaptation? For me, it's always a combination of the two the left-hand side and the right-hand side of my diagram earlier, but mostly it's the inability to adapt. Um, we're talking now about whose fault was it. Uh, I love this little snippet around leadership. We talk a lot about shared leadership. <laughs> I, I had to put that one in. <laughs> but, but, 
but that is typically what happens, isn't it? Something goes wrong. The first question that we ask, whose fault it, was it? Yeah. And so what I want, if there's one thing that I want future leaders in public sector Wales to take away from this is never ask that question first. Okay, that is doomed for a, to create a blame culture. Um, and what a blame culture does, it, it, that specific question does, is it doesn't reduce errors, but it reduces the reporting of errors. Okay, which is a big difference between the two, believe me. Um, so never ask the question, whose fault is it? And I'm going to come at the end of this with four questions I think you should ask around events, but that's certainly not one of them, but that's what we typically do. Um, and I also wanted to mention something which um, is often forgotten in sessions like this and maybe hasn't sort of been a realisation with you or whether you consider this, is that there's not only the first victim of the events, the people that maybe were killed or injured, but there's often the second victim that suffer the events, which are the people involved. You know, there's a lot of research evidence now on the second victim of these events. So it's not just the people and their families, but actually this can have a damaging effect on the people that were in the organisation. Okay, towards a just culture, I've got about 20 minutes left. Um, I've heard so much about a no-blame culture and a just culture over the years, and, and I think it's quite confusing. Sort of 1990s, we were told that we've got to create this no-blame culture. And now the, the, the move is much more towards this just culture. And I'm going to go through this and give you kind of four flawed assumptions that we've got around this um, that hopefully will give you some ways of thinking about the culture of the organisation. So a just culture, I can subscribe to this, okay, that there's an atmosphere of trust. This is your theme for the week. And we need to be clear about where the line must be drawn between acceptable and unacceptable behaviour, okay? Now, that's the tricky bit, yeah? How you do that is... is clearly the difficult bit. And what we find in investigations after the event is that we're always trying to balance between learning from the incident and accountability. People want to hold someone to account, okay? It's a natural human tendency that what we want to do is to say, this person screwed up, therefore it's nothing to do with me, therefore it's not threatening to me because that actually makes us feel a lot better about ourselves. But if we drive to that, we tend to not learn from the events. Okay. So, my first flawed assumption that we generally have around events and, and the aftermath of events. The first one is that they're caused by individual, that individuals can be held to account for these things. Um, but every single accident investigation report that I've seen, particularly the big ones, this is the Columbia report, I could have put any number of other ones up there, it says, look, if you reduce this down to a, a failure of an engineer, an operator, or a manager, or a supervisor that didn't listen, or any number of one of those, you're going to completely miss the point. This was a system error. We need to look at the organisation as a whole if we actually want to learn from these incidents. So it's not about individual error. And this goes back to sort of the bad apple, bad barrel theory. Uh, Zimbardo from the 1970s talks about bad apples or, or bad barrels. And this is where the role of leadership comes into this. Because we tend to have the bad apple mentality. This is an individual who screwed up. Someone was sloppy. They didn't pay attention. They were asleep on the job rather than looking at the situation that's created by the leaders or even the whole system that they're in. So is it a bad apple or was a good apple put into a bad barrel? And who made the barrel in the first place? So maybe we need to start looking upwards here as well as downwards. The second flawed assumption in a lot of the work and a lot of the, the guidance that I've seen around a blame-free culture and a just culture is that we've got to overcome these four evils. Human error, negligence, recklessness, and violations. And if we do that, we can reduce the number of extreme events. Um, but I want to just talk a bit here about human error. 
and just talk around some of the problems with this assumption. And probably a lot of you have seen this video. I think probably most people have seen the video. But I'll play it anyway for those that haven't seen it. Um, if you haven't seen it, the idea here is you've got to count the number of passes by people wearing white shirts, okay? Had anyone not seen it? It's been round, done the rounds, hasn't it? Okay, so if you haven't seen it, how many passes were, were there? Um, more than 17, hands up. Okay, it's quite a few, more than 17. More than 18? More than 19? Okay, less than 17? Less than 16? Less than 15? Okay, so we've got a variation of between about 16 and 19. There are a couple of hands. So that's quite a big variation for a group of intelligent people sitting in relatively nice uh, comfort watching a video that's less than a minute long. Okay, we've got variation, an error rate of 16 to 19 on a really simple task in really good conditions. Okay, now what was the other... Uh, what, what else did you see in the video for those who didn't see it? Okay, so gorilla. Who didn't see a gorilla? Be honest now. Okay, perfect. There are some people that haven't seen this video still left in the world. <laughs> I, I can still get paid. Um, okay. Um, let me play the video again. I promise you that this is the same video. Little tip, don't count this time. Now, that really is scary, isn't it? I can, obviously, a reaction that a lot of people didn't see, the, the gorilla. Um, it's called inattentional blindness. A guy called Daniel Simons did the research on this. The, the problem is that if we focus our attention on a narrow task, like counting the passes, we miss stuff in our broader attentional field. So, focus narrow, you miss the big picture, basically. Just like what happened on the friendly fire Instant, you know, people are looking at a radar console, don't see the bigger picture in their environment. People looking at the big picture can miss the detail. Okay, what strikes me about this this video is that it's not just people miss the gorilla; it's people get get the number wrong. You know, in perfect, pretty much perfect conditions on a great, you couldn't get a bigger screen than that, really, could you? Um, so we got a variation 16 to 19, an error rate, and, and a lot of people in the room missed a great big hairy gorilla walking through, banging its chest and walking out the other side. Okay. Now, my set of assumptions here, the first step on the ladder was human error. You all just made a human error. Yeah? Twice. You know, got the number wrong, a lot of people, and it was 17, by the way, um, and missed the gorilla. You know, the first step on our rung here of leading into a blame culture is that, that humans make, of course humans make errors. You just made one. So if we search for human errors, we're going to find human errors. People, human nature to make errors. Inattentional blindness you cannot get away from, unfortunately. There's an associated concept called change blindness that you might have come across. Um, this person here, can I walk on this? Yeah. This person here is a passerby. This is a researcher. This is a researcher, researcher, researcher. They ask, where's the station? Puts his points to that. Two guys come through carrying a door. All researchers, the two guys at the back swap. This person's now talking to a completely different person. 70% people don't notice that they're talking to someone completely differently. 
It's about 60-70% of people miss the griller as well, by the way. And for that one, if you're really worried now about um, hitting a griller on your way home in your car, um, <laughs> it's not an individual trait, this. It's just how narrow you focus your attention. So it's not that some people are better than others. It's just that you narrowed your attention more. Okay, just in case you were worried. I missed it too. I think, like I say, 70% of people do. Um, the other issue here is that, that it's, it's human nature to experience something called practical drift. And this is the slow and steady uncoupling of local practice from written procedure. Everyone does it. It's natural human tendency to try to find the quick fix, the workaround, the faster, cheaper, easier way of doing your job. Okay, you do it every day. And again, if we go searching for this, we'll find it. It's a natural human nature. It's a natural... Ten the problem is that it becomes normalised, and that is the way that we do things around here, and it becomes embedded into culture. So we drift blindly into a problem state. What happened in the Friendly Fire video, for those that, that didn't pick up on this, um, was that the problem occurred when someone outside the group that had become normalised to this thought people were doing it by the book. So then you've got discrepancy between how people think you're doing it and how it's done inside the organisation. That was the problem in the, the friendly fire. But you've got this practical drift. It's human nature that we're going to do this. Again, if you search out, look for people to blame, you're going to see this all the time, but you do it just as well as I do. Um, what you'll also find is that people diffuse personal responsibility. Diffusion of responsibility. This is Kitty Genovese. She was murdered in the 1970s in New York. An assailant came, the murderer came, stabbed her at her front door. It took about 30 minutes because he went away, came back, finished her off. Um, and 38 people saw it, but no one called the police. Why? Everyone thought someone else had already called the police. People diffuse responsibility to others. Someone's lying injured in the road. People don't give first aid because they think someone else is going to do it. If you're in a big group like this and there's some fire alarm goes off and I stand on the stage and say, well, it's probably a false alarm and someone backs that up, you're not going to move because you're willing, people are willing to diffuse responsibility of decisions, judgments to others. This goes on inside organisations. Human error, again... Look for it, you'll find it, but you do it too. Okay. Um, you might have come across the Stanley Milgram experiments. This is kind of like a 101 psychology part of the session. But I wanted to just give you here a view of why we have human error and lots of different reasons for it, because we know this stuff. Um, obedience to authority. This is a researcher. This is a person dragged in from the street. Behind a white, in, in the room next door, there's an actor. Okay, anyone know this experiment? Darren Brown's repeated this experiment recently. Um, what they've got here is um, a machine that gives electric shocks. The person that's brought in off the street is told that this is a memory test. And if the person doesn't get the question right, you administer an electric shock. And it starts at 15 volts. Here, 15 volts doesn't hurt, does it? It's just like, you know, you would hardly feel it. So first question, wrong administers the, the shock. Next question, next question. Gets up here, we're up to like 150 volts, starts going, ow! Goes here, 240, starts, stop, stop, please stop. 450 volts, okay? They thought at the time of this experiment, Stanley Milgram, that the hypothesis was that 1% of the population would take it right to the end because they would exhibit some kind of sadistic tendency. Okay, about 40% of people took it to 450 volts. Because of the person wearing a white coat with a clipboard saying, this is part of the experiment, it's okay, just carry on, you're going to ruin my results if you don't continue. People have obedience to authority. You are leaders in the organisation. What you say, people will follow. It's been proved for you know, 30 years... 40 years of research on this effect. What you say goes. People will obey. And the problem with this is, and another part of this which I think is critical, so important, 
this point that was made by Owen earlier, what you walk past. Problem here is 15 volts is so easy to accept. So it's okay, 15 volts, take the first step. As soon as you've taken the first step, slippery slope into a problem. Okay. Um, Ron Westrom, fallacy of centrality, a fancy academic terms, apologies. It basically means the higher you go up in the organisation, the more you think you know what's going on inside the organisation, actually the less you know. So Pilkington had been on a Blackhawks. He used to be an F-15 pilot. He'd been on the AWACS. He thought he knew what was going on inside the organisation. Had no idea. And this kind of combines the two things. Leaders not actually knowing what's going on and the steps. People taking 15 volts, 30 volts, 100 volts, 200 volts. And you could see the same thing at mid-staffs. Because if you ask a question of mid-staffs, not of who's to blame which I told, said, please don't ask that question, but why did it make sense to people for a five-year period? Then this normalisation, this drift into problems can account for this. And leaders who became so detached from the front line, they thought they knew what was going on, but didn't. The last one of these on human error is that we all suffer from hindsight bias and what's termed root cause seduction. We all want to be seduced into believing that there are a small number of root causes. And also, at the time of the event to the people involved, it looked like this. It was highly complex. Okay, this is London Underground. The investigation report makes it look like this. Because once you know the outcome, you trace back down a single line of cause and it looks like this, where actually it was like that. That's hindsight bias and root cause seduction. You all suffer from this, I suffer from this. As soon as you know the outcome, you're completely biased in your, your interpretation of the event. So those were flaws in saying it's human error. And flawed assumption three, it's, it's possible to have a disciplinary line between accepted and unaccepted behaviour. Okay. Now... Um, this was mentioned earlier about first engagement with the enemy or you hear these quotes about the first punch on the nose I think we had before. Um, this is another one, sort of Bose law, space. You know, fastest way to get yourself killed on a manned space flight is not to follow standard operating procedure. Second quickest way is to always follow standard operating procedure. There is always going to be this room for manoeuvre, a discretionary space. Okay. Where do you cross the line between compliance and improvisation? And that's set by leaders inside the organisation, usually. So there's a gap, and you're always asking people to bridge that gap, to make that leap. If I'm going to do this today, am I going to do it thoroughly, follow procedure, or do I need to improvise because I've never really seen it like this before? Problem is, if it goes wrong, that person gets blamed. If it goes right, they're a hero. Just like this. You're asking people to make that, that leap. Now, for me, this is absolutely at the crux of this, and it's so difficult. But what I would encourage you to do is not just think, where do we draw the line, but to ask the question, who gets to draw the line? Because if some senior leader says, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable that's cascaded down, then that leads to blame if people don't follow, conform to that. Really, the organisations that are resilient, highly reliable, empower people in that conversation about the discretionary space. So, for me, it's pass that down, get people involved in understanding that space. And flawed assumption four, it's the system and not the individual. We kind of flip this round again. And I see this a lot in, uh, to be honest, public sector organisations. Okay? Because you could follow this whole presentation through and you can say, okay, well, it's not the individual. It, that professor from Cranfield, he's got me off the hook because he said, you know, we all have human errors and it's system and it's, syst you know, it's about system error, so therefore no one to blame, right? Um, but I think that's also a bit of a cop-out here. Um, because people do blame the system rather than actually taking the accountability. Um, 
And I just want to throw this out. I've got a couple of minutes, and again, being challenging as I tend to, to do. If you think about your organisation, there isn't such a thing for me as a broken system, a dysfunctional organisation. It's actually currently perfectly configured to give you the results you're currently getting. Okay? And beyond that, some people in the organisation, maybe you, are profiting from that and want it to remain that way because you're doing really well in that system. Okay? So if you think it's a broken system, someone is creating that system and that's where it comes back to the culture and leadership. Leaders create the culture inside organisations. You're currently creating the culture that's delivering the results that you're currently getting. Therefore, for me, leadership is about challenging that culture, challenging the assumptions that underpin it. And what you're then doing is you're putting your head above the parapet and you're challenging some things that some people, maybe your boss, holds really dear to them. And that, for me, is leadership, real leadership inside the organisation, to say, this is the cu culture, this is what it's currently delivering, and I'm personally not happy with this. I think we need to change. Challenging those assumptions, and I've given you four assumptions around error and around blame, but there are other, obviously other assumptions. So I said I'd give you four questions, um, which I think are critical. The one question not to ask is whose fault was it? Okay, that, that's, I said, that's the big, for me, the big takeaway. Um, the first question, if something goes wrong, what were the reasons for the incident? And notice I've put reasons, not causes. It's quite a subtle change. And I think here, you'll all be aware of the five whys approach to this. Okay, as a leader, you never take the first response that someone says. Why did this happen? They give you a response. Well, why did that happen? You ask five, five whys and you might get to something like the systemic factors that led to the, the incident. So our first question, ask, what were the reasons for the incident? And use the five whys. The second one, I've already mentioned in relation to mid-staffs, which I think is a great example. For five years, it made sense to the individuals involved to operate the way that they did. So the key question, why did it make sense to the individuals to do what they did in that situation? Always ask that question. Third question, who decides in your organisation what happens in that discretionary space? Who sets the line in the sand? Is it the individuals that actually need to take accountability for that decision? If so, they ought to be involved in drawing the line because people that, that are involved, the research shows, take on the accountability and the ownership much more than if it's just been forced down from the top. And the last question, which again is the really challenging one, link back to this leaders, leaders create the culture, is have I been creating what's actually going on inside the organisation? Okay. If you're interested in learning a bit more about this, you can contact me. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn and so on. Feel free to drop me a note. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks.